Data science pipelines. Typically, more data outperforms better algorithm, which means we often work with very, very large sets of data, usually by sending it through a pipeline. Remember, our goal is the true model. Training data used to develop the model. Validation data used to test during development. And testing data to test the final trained model, often called the gold standard. Remember, signal plus noise is model plus error. Remember, Polya's method. So we have these four steps uh, in order to carry out the data science version of Polya's problem. Pre-processing, representations, and computation. That's our algorithms, metrics. And we can think of that as a pipeline. Data goes to pre-processing, to representation, to algorithm, to metric, and that produces results. Typically, we have training data and we have testing data. We split the training data into training and validation. The testing data, we move off by itself. We're not going to touch it until the end. And then our data goes through pre-processing and representation and algorithm and then metrics and then finally results. But you only use training data and validation to develop the pipeline. So you develop the pipeline for these three parts, metrics to assess every step actually. So you can think of the first three parts often are implemented in code. And then once you've finished your pipeline, you can apply it to the testing data and assess the model. For example, uh, cameo and osmancic are two different types of rice. There's pictures of them. We'd like to be able to distinguish them from each other, if perhaps if they were mixed in together. So researchers set up an optical system and obtained seven features using imaging techniques for the two different classes of rice. These are the features or attributes, area, perimeter, major axis length, minor axis length, eccentricity, convex area, extent. This is the reference for the paper. Here's the data. Notice the different orders of magnitude. And notice there are no missing values. So we have 3,810 uh, different samples of the two classes of rice. So we begin by comparing the two different classes. Here are our two classes, Cameo and Osmancic. And if we do a group by, we see that there are about 1,630 of the Cameo and 2,180 of the Osmancic. Let's compare their means across these features. So you can see the area and the perimeter, maybe not that different, major axis length, minor axis length. So can we use these features to distinguish between these two? Well, let's look at some histograms. This code produces the histograms. Here are our first four histograms for the two different classes of rice. And then here are three more. And you'll notice the major axis length and the perimeter look like they're fairly well separated. Now we're going to take the categorical class and replace it by a target of 0 and 1. You can see that here. This is just the first four, but everything in the target column is zeros and ones. And we can separate 20% of the data into a test set. And we're not going to touch the test set while the solution is being developed. So we'll develop our solution using DF train, where DF train is the result of this train test split. You can see the first five uh, rows of that here. DF test, we're not going to see again until we've developed our model and are ready to assess it. So here is our training information. Let's split the features from the target. 
and now we have the target is a separate array and it's the response and here is the description of the uh, ones that we have remaining not surprisingly we need to rescale the data so if you noticed we had different orders of magnitude so let's do a standard scalar and notice now We've standardized, so every column now has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And we can compare these columns to each other now. Let's split our data so we can develop a solution using a random forest. And notice here that we're actually using validation data because the testing data we're going to use at the very end and we're not going to touch it until then. So this is training and validation data from our scaled features. Here's our random forest classifier. We fit it to the training data, scored on the validation data, and 0 0.936. Well, let's see if we maybe we can find the best parameters for our random forest classifier. So there are many different things I could do, but this is a little slow, so I'm just going to look at the criteria. Gini coefficient or entropy, information gain, uh, maximum depth, and the minimum samples per leaf. So we run this, our, fit our grid search CV estimator. Uh, it does five folds for each of the possible candidate models, 250 fits altogether. The best score was 0 0.93, and this is a, not for a single test, but a, a five-fold uh, cross-validation, 0 0.93. Here are our best parameters, and here is our best estimator, and that estimator is equivalent to creating a random forest classifier with those parameters, which you can see here. Now, very often, we just simply use the best estimator as our estimator moving forward. And here's our test data. Notice we're ready to look at our test data because we've developed a method for getting from the raw data to a solution. We're going to scale and then do a random forest using the best parameters we found in the grid search. So here's our pipeline. It's a simple pipeline. We do a standard scalar, then our best parameter random force classifier. We fit the pipeline to the training data, which was features and target. And then we split the test into test features and test target, and then score and analyze the pipe just like it was any other estimator. So the pipeline was developed for and then fit to the training data. So the only place we see the test data is the scoring and prediction and analysis. So it's strictly used to assess. Uh, we don't develop the model on anything other than our training data. And now we can look at our cross-validation score, which is about a 0 0.9. This is on the test features in the test target. We can look at a receiver operating characteristic and turns out we've done a pretty good job. But we're not finished. A model should do more than predict labels. It should enlighten, inform, sometimes even entertain. An interpretation is more than just metrics. Charts, diagrams, histograms, illustrations, parameter estimates, sensitivity, stability, diagnostics, forecasts, predictions, feature selection and significance, hypothesis formation, science. So let's look at some science here. We have feature importance that we can get from a random forest classifier. This is a nice feature of a random forest. It uses each feature many times with many trees, and each time we use that feature, we look at the change in impurity, or if it's entropy, the information gain. 
So feature importances can be calculated as the mean or average decreased in purity. And if that was entropy, it would be the average information gain. Notice that when we plot this in a bar chart, that what stands out is the perimeter and the major axis length. Here they are, and we notice that they seem to have significant differences in their means when we saw them as histograms. Now we can actually restrict our data to these uh, significant columns and notice that we get a pretty good score using only these two features. In other words, we've done some science. We've shown that these two different uh, types of rice can be distinguished based on perimeter and their major axis length. Maybe not something you can see just by looking at the picture. That is, data science is science. We could have actually obtained these results uh, or similar to them using statistical tests like a t-test, for example. But the point is that the goal of predictive modeling and data science is not label prediction or just simple regression. It is to provide evidence for or against scientific hypotheses so as to advance human understanding. A rigid pipeline is similar to the scientific method and is a best practice for scientific reproducibility as data science is part of science.